Welcome to Lamb of God Church. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and electronic devices before our service begins. Thank you. And you probably noticed that there are plastic bags on your chair. We hope that you will take one home, fill it up with canned goods or non-perishable goods, and bring it back next week for interfaith uh, charities. This summer is a tough time for them, so we appreciate anything you can do. And there is a red school box, a schoolhouse in the back where we'll be collecting school supplies. Um, this goes to several different schools, several different um, classrooms and children that need help getting school supplies. So we hope that you will. There is a detailed list in the bulletin. We hope you'll take a look and you can help with that if you're able. And do we have any first time visitors? If you just raise your hand, our ushers will bring you some information about our church and we're so glad that you're here. No? All right, one last announcement. We'd like to say good morning to Walter Schumann. He's here with us this morning as James is away. I'd like to uh, thank you. Uh, hold your applause, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, both the bishops of the Lutheran Church and uh, of the Episcopal Church have written letters to the pastors of their communities. And they have asked us to remember this weekend in prayer uh, that we call on prayer for the children at our borders. Regardless of what our government position may take, we pray for peace and quiet, tenderness, love and concern for children who have been left at the borders and have now are needing tremendous love and attention. So we will remember them in our prayers and then if the uh, Lamb of God takes further action, that would be wonderful. But at this point, they're simply calling for prayer. So I will include them in our prayer of the church. Let us begin our worship. Patience, Lord. Patience, Lord. 
patient. Take a deep breath. Let the still small voice enter the depths of your soul. Now breathe out. Let go. Let go. Fears, worries, control. Let go. Breathe out. Take another deep breath. Smell the wind. Feel the wind blowing through. Now breathe out all the weeds that choke, that keep you from blossoming. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit is with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, there is so much to do. We see weeds all around us. And we want to pull them out. Give us patience this morning to let the wheat grow. Help us to be cedars of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You hear the word of God. The reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. It's from the message. So, don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant, greeting God with a childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. All around us, we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We are also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. 
We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us, but the longer we wait, the larger we become, and the more joyful our expectancy. The Word of God, the Word of Life. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed wheat, weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them, that is, the weeds? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds, the first, and then bind them into bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. The Gospel of the Lord. I think James is very, very unfair with me. This is the hardest text to preach on, and he takes a, not a holiday, he's on a retreat with one of my great mentors, Philip Newell. Uh, he'll come back a holy man, he will. <laughs> this text this morning, the parable of the weeds, and the wheat is probably one of the most difficult parables in the Bible because there, there is no consensus among the scholars on how to interpret it. So, I'm going to just add one more interpretation among the thousands of people that are trying to figure out what this parable means. I did have a revelation about it, though. The other day I was working in my garden and of course I was pulling out the weeds. But my lovely neighbor next door across the way stopped by to chat. Why are you always out there in the hot sun doing the same thing every day? Don't you get it? 
weeds are here to stay. You ought to find something better to do with your time, especially at your age. You should know better. Well, that ended the nice chat. I went in to work on this sermon, that's the truth. Reading the text from the words of Jesus, let the weeds and the wheat grow together. Maybe my neighbor was right. Maybe I'm too much of a weeder and not a cedar. So the title of the sermon, Weeders and Cedars. Are you a plucker-upper? Are you a planter-upper, planter-down? Let's go back to the parable, just to lay it out so we have some understanding of the way it goes. And this is not an allegorical interpretation, but this is just the way it's laid out. It begins with a sower. He sows good seeds. And that possibly, to the audience, when it was first preached, probably meant Jesus or anyone, anyone who sows good seeds in the kingdom. They're the seeders. The next are the seeds. That's the good news of the kingdom. Justice, mercy, righteousness, peace, and forgiveness. Good seeds. And then there's this field out there. And that, perhaps, could refer to the world, but most likely, in the, when it was first preached and used by Matthew, it meant the church. And Matthew is writing to this church. We know his, his letter, or it was really later called the gospel was to this church that he was a pastor of some sort. But it also could mean the field, it could mean our family, it could mean our neighborhood, and it could mean, specifically this morning, Lamb of God, the field out there. And then there's this enemy, the devil. That's easy. But, be careful. The enemy also can be anyone who chokes out the good seed, that keeps good from flourishing. And we all know those kind of people in our life. They rain on our parade. It's like my neighbor telling me I'm too old. Poor <laughs> hey, that he's a weeder. <coughs> And then the harvest. Some have always thought it's the last judgment, but there's good reason to believe it's not only the last judgment. It could mean whatever God intends for his creation at the end. In the epistle, we hear God intends for the creation to groan like a pregnant woman for the new birth. It might mean that instead of a hellfire and damnation. Let's throw them in and clean it up different views about the last judgment. So here is what we're to ponder after we lay that out, the story. This is the thing to ponder. How do we live in the church, in the family, with ourselves, where weeds and seeds exist side by side? Or to put it another way, how do we live in this period from seed time to harvest? If you hold on, try to use metaphors. Jesus was a master of metaphor. That's what a parable is, an extended metaphor. Try to hold on that inside of you there is both a weed and a seed of wheat. And it's in the church, it's in our nation, Oh, is it in the nation? So we got the weeders up there. But it's a part of us. Try to hold that metaphor in your mind. Now, the parable takes on incredible, incredible power at the very beginning. The householder speaks, and he does reflect the one who sows kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. It probably is Jesus or some person who sows good seed. And he First thing he says, basically implying patience, patience. 
Let them both grow together. Why? I mean, this is bad agriculture. Because of the temptation of rooting out evil is fraught with all kinds of dangers. Weeds look like wheat. You might destroy the good seed when trying to pull out the weeds. Think how many times, and I know this is true for all of us, think how many times when we have misjudged someone by their clothing, what they're wearing. We misjudge them by the color of their skin, by their demeanor or their speech, or their addictive habits. But what is going on here in our misjudging them is something so subtle we rarely catch it. We're confusing weeds with what is contrary to our wishes and our desires, and sometimes our bigotry. We're confusing it and calling it a weed because we don't like it. For example, in America today, we have the incessant need for harmony and unity. We have an idea of a picture of a harmonious society in an old phrase called the melting pot. Well, nothing melted in this pot. It's a dream that we'll all be alike, inheritors of this unity where we are all the one. Among the many, there is the one. And there is a movement afoot today to root out anything that is not in sync with this desire of unity. So we build walls to keep foreigners out. I wouldn't be here today. I'm first generation. And now even children are kept at the borders, lest they contaminate our soil. We have set up securities to monitor anything that does not fit into this mindset. But what we're rooting out is not necessarily weeds. It's things that are contrary to our wishes and our desires, and more often than not, our bigotry. So Jesus at least said, patience, check yourself first, patience. Here's another, there is yet another reason though, Jesus counsels us with patience. In rooting out weeds, the evil often is entangled in the good. There was a day when I had the most beautiful Scots lawn in the neighborhood. But then there was spring in Ohio, and there was the dandelions. <laughs> and I would pull them out with a vengeance and take a nice clod of Scott's lawn with it. I no longer have grass, all natives, weeds, and seeds. We know when you pull out a dandelion that its roots are so entangled in the grass you can't get it out without taking the, the grass. Well, it's simply Jesus is saying that in the depths of, of our roots were entangled with good and evil. On our trip to Poland two weeks ago, and I will stay here for a couple hours if you want to hear about my trip, we had a chance to see Oscar Schindler's factory. The place where the movie was made and produced. It was horrifying to be in the very factory, the very place where Jews were exploited as cheap labor. Basically building materials for their own destruction under the guise of this man named Schindler. Schindler was an evil man. And yet, 
There was another side to this conflicted Roman Catholic Nazi. As the war went on, he became appalled at the horrors of the, quote, the final solution to extinguish all Jews from the face of the earth. At considerable risk, twice he was arrested by the Third Reich. He protected thousands of workers from the death camp that was right down the road that we visited in the same day. Auschwitz. One of the survivors said of him in the journal, he was our father, our father, our mother, our only hope. He never let us down. He acted for us. So I ask you this morning, would, Schim would Schindler be among the wheat? Or the weeds? Or have the roots of his life been so entangled with good and evil? By the way, he became a very, very rich man by even protecting the Jews. There was nothing that wasn't tainted with this man. So if, if this was a picture of our humanity, that we are so entangled in our deep roots, is it possible even to pull one or the other? And I think in a less exaggerated form, the same divided nature exists within us. The wheat and the weeds, the sinner and the saint, the great mathematician and theologian of the 17th century, Pascal wrote this, and he was right. What a chimera is man. What a novelty. What a monster. What a chaos. What a contradiction. What a prodigy. Judge of all things. Imbecile worm of the earth. Depository of truth a sink of uncertainty and error. And now he makes his point. The glory and the shame of the universe. Who can unravel this truth? And what I'm saying to you, what is inside of us, in the core of our very being, is true in our families. It's true in the church. It's here at Lamb of God. It's in our society. And most blatantly obvious in our nation. So who can judge? Who can judge? Who can do the pulling for us? We're not capable of doing it without destroying the good. Patience. You know, I struggled with this really hard this week. And this is actually the third rewrite in three buckets. Right? The three of them went in a bucket. Uh, and I finally got this. I think I'm right here. I think Jesus knew that the problem was, was not just confusing wheat and weeds. That's pretty obvious. He doesn't use obvious things to tell us about. We all confuse wheat and weeds. That's an obvious. And in, in Jesus' day, there was actually the wheat was called darnel, which was a, a weed that looked like wheat in the early stages. So I don't think that's the problem. It's part of it. I think the real frustration and the things that were bothering the early church was this, that they had hoped in the church that there wouldn't be this mixture of wheat and weeds. They were hoping for a dedicated, committed community. They were hoping for a holy priesthood of God. That's written in there. Holy, priest, priestly, pure. <laughs> but it wasn't to be, and never will be. And so the frustration 
got so severe in the church that Jesus had to address it, Matthew using it to address his church. You see, what the early church followers wanted so dearly is to be a model as our, as our early fathers believed that we would be the citadel on the hill. And we would be the model. But it wasn't to be. Because we look just like everyone else. We and we together. They dream, they dream of this harmony, this fellowship, this purity. But it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And those that claim it exist, be careful. The holiness group. In the church, at Lamb of God, there's always going to be wheat and weeds, and they'll all grow together. And what bothers us most, and I think it's the real issue, is that there's this gap. And we can't stand it. We can't stand in our own life. I'm spending my whole time, and Luther's love of guilt, you know. Oh, gosh, I love to be guilty. I was raised on guilt, and I thrive on it. That's why I'm Luther. What we want is to, is to try to make ourselves nice and good and clean. And if I have to, I'll go to a monastery. But bad boy Walter, is not able to do it in the real world. I'm a mixture, you're a mixture. And soon as we try and we get this inside of us that we want to have a nice, clean society, a nice, clean church, we want to remove the gap, and we can't. And so tremendous frustration gets us, spiritually and as a community. I would even go so far to say that most of the wars, religious wars and heresy trials were based on this terrible, terrible need to have a purified church, a purified church. So what's the answer? Throw up our hands and say, okay, weeds, have your day. Let them grow. Let the weeds grow with the wheat. That's not the answer. But the problem is, we should have told Jesus this. It comes in the next week. Parable. It's not in this one. It's in the next week's parable of the mustard seed. Where Jesus addresses the issue of what the church should be doing. And that is setting down seeds to be cedars and not weeders. And you know, I spend a lot of time out here, two, two hours a day, actually. Weeding is no fun. It isn't. It doesn't. Who gets fun out of that? The greatest fun I had in life is to set down seeds, be a seeder. I can sit back and wait for it to grow and watch the flowers. I say to us here in the church, let the weeders do what they want. Let them weed all day if they want to. And finally destroy what they're going to get when they get the thing cleaned up. Let them go. We need to spend our time in setting down seeds to be seers in the kingdom of God. And we all know that if you set down a good seed and the seedling grows, it will choke out the weeds. And that's what the parable next week is about so you don't have to come. <laughs> the mustard seed, that's what it's about. If you set down the seeds, it will not only take over, but you have the joy of watching it. I want to close with this. I have gone through periods in my life when I have spent an enormous amount of time weeding. Weeding is just, it's another form of judgment, but we judge, so, we judge ourselves, I judge myself so harshly. And so, 
It wasn't until I actually worked in the garden and I began to have this revelation that this is not what I want to do the rest of my life. I don't want to spend my life weeping. I want to spend the rest of my life until the harvest smelling flowers. And that's what we should do in the church.
We pray to you, Lord, using the response, hear us, O God. We pray for your church around the world that together we may improve the quality of life of the many and seek the common good in all that we ask of you. We pray for world leaders, that they may listen to the voices of those who live in poverty, fear, disease, hunger, war, homelessness, or hopelessness, and begin to use their power generously for the good of all. We also pray for those who were killed on the Malaysia flight and their families. And all that we ask of you, we pray for the leaders of our government, May the seeds of justice bear fruit in their hearts so that all people can find ways to meet their basic needs and prompt them to do something about the children speedily at our borders. In all that we ask of you, we pray for all who are traveling this summer that God will watch over them, preserve them from harm, and renew them through their visits with loved ones and encounters with nature's beauty. In all that we ask of you, we pray for those we have placed on the Lamb of God prayer list. Stephen, Don, Liz, Barbara, Dennis, Carl, Julie, Wilson, Sarah, Sharon, Charlie, Brendan, Linda, Kathy, David, and the Malcolmson's family. May God's loving embrace be felt by all who suffer, particularly those whose names we hold in our heart or speak out loud. In all that we ask of you, we lift up all who spread the word of God, for preachers, teachers, and all who share God's loving compassion faithfully and convincingly, so that others may encounter the living God, especially our pastors James and Walter, and the staff and volunteers at Lamb of God. In all that we ask of you, we give our deepest thanks for the many blessings of our lives, for the joy of family, for friends, home, health, and healing. In all that we ask of you, Father God, we pray for all who have died, confident that they are sheltered by the power of your love. May those left behind be comforted in their grief, especially the friends and family of Sam Garcia. In all that we ask of you, we lift our prayers to you, Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we are gathered in the name of your Son, Jesus. And all that we ask of you, Amen. Now the peace of the Lord be with you always. Share the peace with one another. That is so
Did I have a mic to give them so I can use a mic? Is there a next one up there? Thank you. You got a dog and pony show here the other day. Um, I have a question for you. Are you ready for this? You were talking about the gifts of the Spirit, right? Yeah. How do you think I knew that? Because I wasn't in your class. Oh. The teacher told me. Okay, that's a good start. But. You were talking about the gifts of love. And I want to tell, tell me what's on your paper. I didn't, I didn't, there's this I love stuff all over the place. I love mom, daddy, grandparents, the pastor, Walter. No, it's not on there. <laughs> it's on this one? Okay. But did anybody say something very, very unusual on your paper? I mean, you'd say, this is a hot item. I like Doritos. You, <laughs> you like, but that's not love. You don't love to be Doritos, do you? Do you caress them? No. <gasps> Doritos, I love you. Anybody else said anything besides Doritos? What did you say? Go ahead. I'll make it up. You love God. Oh, that's, you know, that's getting off easy. Okay. Here's my question. It's a very, very serious question. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question, then you think of the answer. Have any of you ever said, and listen to this question, have any of you ever said, I'm sorry? You have? Is there anyone here that would tell me what it was like? Could you tell me what it was like? Like is an object. Okay, like is an object, but what was it like to say, I'm sorry? Did you ever say that? It Who? was like just saying that you're really sorry for what you did and hoping that they will accept your apology. Oh, did you hear that? Said, oh, I'm going to say it real loud so you can hear it. Saying, I'm sorry, and you're hoping they will accept your apology. Okay. Anybody say anything else different than that when you said you're, you're sorry? Did anybody add something to it or anything? Okay, now, are you an instrumentalist? <laughs> Go see Trent. <laughs> okay, now, here's the question. This is very serious, very serious. Do you believe this? Now listen, do you believe if you love someone, really love them, you don't have to say you're sorry? Think about that's a riddle. I know that's heavy weight, but think, do you have to say, if you love someone, do you have to say, I'm sorry? Why? Um, you, might, you might hurt them really badly and they might feel bad. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Do you hear that? You might hurt them really bad, and even though you love them, you know, you've got to say, I'm sorry for doing that. All right. Here's the answer. This is a quick answer because I want to let you go. There's a foolish movie a long time called Love Story. Your mama and your dad and your grandparents saw it and I saw it. And it said this stupid thing. If you love someone, you don't have to say you're sorry. That's not true, is it? Because of this. If you really love someone, you say, I'm sorry. Right? So, next time you hurt somebody, or somebody hurts you. Don't say, well, I know mama loves me. But you want to go up to mama and say, I love you, therefore I am sorry. You're going to practice that this week, saying I'm sorry every time you kick somebody from behind. You're going to say, I'm sorry. You're going to promise to do that? You're going to promise to do it? You all promising that to do it? Constantly say, I'm sorry. Oh, you gotta, you, you're going to do it, aren't you? Yes. Who, who are you going to say it first? Who's going to get the first sorry? My brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's enough. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Goodbye.
Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, Dren, what are we going to do? God gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all I may know and care for, you prepare us for this feast through the bread and life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is indeed right and our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in the unending hymn singing. mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, who on in the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Now we are both to say the Lord's Prayer together, holding our hands. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us.
Gracious God, loving all your family with mother's tender care, as you send the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist those today who are sent forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick and homebound and in prison. May your love and care nourish and strengthen all those who have received this sacrament. Give them comfort in your abiding presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord.